Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it's, I must say, it's just wonderful to see such a diverse range of people from you know, all across my career here today. Yeah, it's really, really special. So many colleagues and many, many friends and family. So I'd like to, uh, to talk to you today, as Alan mentioned, about uh, new, dr new drugs for old diseases. And I should really mention something about this subtitle to my lecture, this, uh, these, these three things that I mentioned here. So malaria, the common cold, and a greasy hedgehog. So I'm sure many of you are here for the greasy hedgehog. I'll get to that at the end. But <laughs> these are areas which have, um, to some extent, defined my career over the, over the past years. Um, perhaps above all, malaria, um, which is obviously a devastating disease, um, particularly the, of the developing world. The common cold, which we're all familiar with. I've got one right now. Sounds like several people already have. By the end of this, we'll all have one, I'm sure. Um, the virus is down here. I'll be saying a few words about that. I mean, we're less interested in the common cold, but more, more in diseases that it, that it exacerbates. And finally, the greasy hedgehog. So like I said, we'll come on to it later. But it's a topic that my group has become very excited about. It's become, become an important area of our, our lab, to the extent that some of my group actually have started dressing up like hedgehogs. <laughs> so that's Noka and Paulina there. Uh, so I'll get to that at the end. OK, so what, what else is this, uh, is this lecture about? So it's not just about those areas which I've mentioned, which are kind of the science. It's about two areas that have really kept me busy and made me think a lot about, about over the last few years. I mean, this balance and sometimes tension and, and also communication between chemistry so as a subject and biology. Um, so these two, these two areas don't always sit gently together, but you know, the, the interface, the friction leads to some really interesting things. So I'll be talking a bit about how I've tried to reconcile those two areas in my lab and in my, in my career. It's about some places that I've been to, so obviously the places I've worked. Um, Alan's mentioned some of these already. I've been lucky enough to work in some very beautiful places, that's certainly true. But m more than all of these things, it's really about the colleagues and friends and family who've impacted my career over, over, the, over the decades. 20 years altogether that I've, I think I've been working in research pretty much. Um, so I'll be talking about all of, these, all of these people today, some of whom are in the audience, but don't worry, I'll be, I'll be nice. So. If I may, I'd like to start at the beginning, so the beginning of all of us, if you like. And I'd like to start back at the beginning of, with DNA. So DNA is clearly where we all come from, right? So this is Sir Francis Crick up here. And he posited this, this central dogma of, of biology or of, of life, pretty much. Um, the idea that sequence information flows from nucleic acids, that's DNA and RNA, into protein. And when he first formulated this back in the 50s, he, he said that it couldn't flow the other way. There was no possibility for it to go anywhere else. It had to go from your DNA into your proteins. So the purpose of DNA, its main purpose, is to produce proteins. And that's certainly true. So DNA is mo these molecules over here. The first thing that happens to DNA is they get transcribed. So they turn into something called mRNA, which is sort of a messenger, an intermediate messenger that then carries that message onwards. These messages get recognized by big machines in the cell called ribosomes. These are enormous molecular machines that synthesize, just there to synthesize proteins from the messenger that they're given. So this is a process called translation, and it results in, it results in proteins. So DNA is transformed by several steps into, into protein sequences. So your DNA tends to stay constant. You've got a, a certain set of sequences in your DNA, and that, they get, they get uh, transcribed and translated into protein repeatedly, billions and many billions of times over the lifetime of a cell. So there can be, obviously, many billions of protein molecules produced from a single molecule of DNA. One of the really fascinating things about DNA is the way in which it encodes that information. So it's actually beautifully simple, and, and it pervades all of life, of course. So from the smallest bacteria all the way up to the most complicated organisms, this, this code broadly applies. So it's, a very, it's, very, it's simple and beautiful in the sense that it has a program. So it has a start and a stop, and the stuff that goes in between is the protein sequence that, that that DNA codes for. So it starts off as, D as DNA, the message looks something like this, and each of these three sets of bases here, these three uh, um, nucleotides, this codes for the start codon, which is methionine, the amino acids come in the middle, this happens to be phenylalanine, and then at the end, there's a stop codon, which tells the ribosome, this machine up here, when to stop turning that sequence into a protein. So a beautifully simple, programmatic way of turning information in your DNA into information at the protein level. And that creates a chain of amino acids. So in this case, it would be methionine and then phenylalanine, and then it would stop. But of course, most proteins are much longer than this. So we get a, set, a sequence here of maybe 60 to hundreds or even thousands of amino acids when you have a proper protein translated at, at this level. 
And then one of the things that has always amazed me as a, as a scientist, as a chemist, is the idea that in many cases, that primary amino acid sequence actually encodes not just a string of amino acids, because that would be pretty boring. It encodes an entire intact folded protein that has actual function in the cell. And it's really that information of how that protein then folds into this much more complicated um, structure over here that's the, the fundamental of what makes this field interesting, particularly as a chemist. So how does this process happen? So this is the process of folding. We have a chain of amino acids. And the interactions between all of these amino acids are what tell this protein how to form this complex structure. So you can see it doing, doing this here in this sort of cartoon. You can see how that protein then folds together. It's this long chain of amino acids folds up into a complicated 3D structure. And you can see each of these amino acids has a, has a letter associated with it and a chemical structure associated with it. And ultimately, that then forms a surface. And that's also a very interesting point about proteins. They, all of those amino acids, they may look a bit wiggly and squiggly, but ultimately they present a surface to the outside world. And it's that surface that interacts with other proteins and with other parts of the cell and gives the protein function. So here's that protein again. It's called GCSF for granulocyte colony stimulating factor. All proteins have, have odd names and codes and difficult to remember. And we'll come, come on to a notable example at the end, of course. But um, this, is a, this is that protein, the surface that it presents to the world, if you like. And normally, this protein is going to be surrounded by water molecules, these things, these things in red here. And this is very important. So this is a fundamental reason why proteins fold the way they do. And it comes back into this, into this lecture several times. The concept that this protein is folding because it tries to bury amino acids that it doesn't want to expose to water. So this concept is called hydrophobicity, the idea of hating water. So it's shown here, very ably demonstrated by my, by my daughter, Chloe, up here. Hydrophobic amino acids, water-hating amino acids. It's a little bit mean. She actually loves water, but uh, she was really angry with me when we happened to be next to the swimming pool. So. So you can see here, I've tried to show this, that the amino acids that are hydrophobic are the ones which are shown with balls. So they're really buried right down in the middle of the protein. Okay, so they're, they're not seeing the water at all. On the contrary, the ones that are hydrophilic sit on the outside surface. So the water-loving amino acids sit on the outside. So they see the water. So it's the same kind of idea as oil and water not mixing. So the oily, oily amino acids stay in the middle and the, and the water-loving ones stay on the outside. And this, to a large extent, is what drives the structure of the protein at the end. And this is very important for this particular protein because it then it needs to interact with a receptor. So it's a, it's a type of signaling molecule. It interacts with a receptor, and then it has a function in the body. So this is what happens. The protein is able to form its interaction with this purple molecule, which is the receptor that it binds to. And all of this complicated 3D structure is really devoted to setting up an interface here between the purple protein and, this one, and, the, and, and the GCSF protein at the top. So these interactions down here are the ones that are specific and, and produce the function in the, in the cell or in the body. And in this case, if you take this protein as a drug, as you might, if you're suffering from um, a lack of blood cells, this will stimulate an enormous production of blood cells in your body. So it's a, it's a drug currently on the market in several formulations. So the structure that that protein takes in terms of three dimensions is absolutely critical for how it can play its role in the body. Okay? And the way it does that is really through chemistry. It's through hiding hydrophobic um, chemistry inside the protein and reve revealing hydrophilic surface on the outside. So one other perhaps you know, maybe not fully appreciated fact is that over a dozen Nobel Prizes in chemistry have been awarded purely for protein-related science. So either the structures or the functions or their roles in the cell. Very, very large number of Nobel Prizes in chemistry just devoted to this particular subject. And they come in a whole range of different forms. This just shows the number of structures that have been solved of proteins across, uh, across the decades. And it's, it grows all the time. This is actually quite out of date. But they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And that, you know, all of these things are folded by similar mechanisms to the ones I showed before to produce different sorts of function in the cell. So what do these things do? They do pretty much everything. I mean, proteins are, are, the, you know, are, the, are the thing which give, give cells function effectively. They can produce these enormous molecular machines that produce energy in your mitochondria, for example. They can provide the mechanisms by which your DNA gets separated into daughter cells when your cells divide. They can produce the ability of, of protein molecules to move around the cell. So sending molecules to different parts of the cell, that's what's shown here. And this molecule, actin, which is shown in white here, is produced as filaments at the leading edge of cells that are trying to migrate. So those proteins are sort of pushing out the edge of the cell and allowing that, that cell to move along. So basically everything that you do, everything all of your cells do, is down to proteins.
which leads us back to the central dogma again. So it's become abundantly clear over the past couple of decades that there, there is it, this linear direction of, of information flow is simply not true. Proteins are the things that are, that are functional. They're also the things that selection is done on. So natural selection happens at the level of proteins. Proteins give function and therefore selection. And it would be completely ridiculous if proteins then didn't have an impact on the DNA itself. And indeed they do. So they're responsible, of course, for controlling translation and transcription very intimately. And they're responsible, for example, for changing the sequence of your DNA. So the, the environment that you grow up in and the, and the kinds of things you're exposed to can actually change the DNA sequence that you have. And that can also be in inherited by your children. So in my case, with me and my wife, this resulted in, in two very beautiful outcomes down here. Joseph and Chloe, and Raph, my wife. So this is a, a way in which proteins can actually influence the, in the heritability of information. Okay, so going back to me, to, to me then, I, going back to my origins, I mean, the same, the, the same kind of thing for my parents resulted in, a, I hope you'll agree, similarly uh, cute outcome. <laughs> so, so this is me, sweltering the heat of probably 1976 or 77. It was very hot those, those last few years of, of the 70s. And we were up there in Barnsley. I was born in Barnsley. And, and then we rapidly moved. I don't know if it was because of the heat. That seems a bit unlikely. Um, no, it wasn't because of the heat. <laughs> so we moved, we moved down south. We moved to the Midlands, where I was able to take advantage of a very beautiful school. This is Great Houghton Prep School, where I did my, my primary education. A really, a really special school, a beautiful environment, very green. And some fantastic teachers. And you can see some very natty uniforms up here as well. See these green ones. I've got to say, when, I start, when you start preparing for one of these lectures, you discover a lot of very strange things that Google now allows you to access. And one of those, I mean, unfortunately, the school closed a couple of years ago. But one, one slightly disturbing, well, disturbing, it's quite nice, I guess, is that our uniforms have now ended up in Uganda. And these guys are definitely enjoying wearing them as much as we did, which is great. <laughs> it's really nice. So, I mean, this, uh, this, this schooling certainly instilled in me and, and also my secondary school really a, a love of learning, fundamentally of learning. And I remember I was probably about 11 years old, and my parents asked me what I wanted to be, and I told them that I wanted to be a professor. <laughs> yeah, and, they, and their, their answer was, well, probably don't pin your hopes on it, really, because it's a very political process. You know, you have to wait for the last person to, you know, to pop the clogs or something. So, so I mean, in the days when the, you know, professorships were based on chairs and, you know, you had to wait for the next person to move on before you could take it. Um, now I've got to say it's a much less political process and certainly based much more on merit, I think. But still, the, the, the idea was there that maybe one day I'd like to be a professor, so I'm very happy to have got there. Music was certainly an important part of my life. Um, I, yeah, it was certainly a, a subject that I took a great interest in. And also chemistry. Um, I mean, partly because other subjects didn't take me quite as, quite, didn't, didn't really grab me quite as strongly. I, I'd say in particular, that I was particularly poor at languages, which turned out to be a bad thing, and also biology, because at the time, I think the curriculum really didn't reflect all of those things I've just told you, which is that chemistry fundamentally underpins biology. If I'd been told that at the beginning, I'd almost certainly have become a biologist, well, maybe a chemical biologist anyway. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I, unfortunately, at school in those days was not really, not, not really telling you that this, that this was really a molecular and had some kind of a, a theoretical basis to it. So then I went up to Durham, as, as Alan mentioned. And this is a very beautiful city. I mean, if you haven't been there before, I encourage you to go there straight away. It's, uh, this is the view out of my uh, dormitory window at Grade College, a view down onto the, onto the cathedral there. And it's a very beautiful city, also in the winter, when it's obviously dark most of the time and extremely cold. But still, you can, you can kind of see, see how pretty this city becomes. And I, in fact, they say that it was the inspiration, as you, you can kind of tell, for the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the, the famous lamppost there was inspired by Durham. But anyway, I was, I was doing a chemistry degree, and during your chemistry degree, you do a research project, and that research project for me involved the, uh, the chemistry of these molecules here called dendromas, which are built up in several stages. So each one represents a generation. That dendroma gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you add additional layers of chemicals to it. Um, or alternatively, I was just looking for chemistry that reflected my taste in shirts. Hard to tell, <laughs> but anyway, I'm not really sure. That project didn't go so well. I think I reached about gen generation two of the dendroma before everything went, well, to a sort of sludge. That didn't, that didn't go, go great. I was working in Dave Parker's lab. I think, I think this was the first time he worked on dendromas and probably the last time he did. And Patrick Steele, who vibed me at the end of my, of, of my, of my project and 
you know, aside from thing, I don't recall it going so well, but now I actually do PhD vivas with these guys, so you know, I'm sure I'm sure they don't remem remember that. <laughs> but yeah, perhaps not a fantastically um, productive experience in the lab in that particular case, but it, it, was, it was not. It was certainly not for nothing. So. One of, the, one of the things that probably struck me the most during my, during my undergraduate degree was this idea of total synthesis. So I was introduced for the first time to the idea that chemists can make molecules. So what I've been telling you up till now is about the chemistry of life, if you like. And obviously that chemistry happens regardless of whether we understand it or not. It, it, it happens and it's up to us to try and understand it. In this case, this is about chemistry that happens only because we, we, we make it happen. And I, I, I'm quoting here from, from this guy, Frederick Voller, who said, I can no longer, so to speak, hold my chemical water and must tell you that I can make urea without needing a kidney, whether of man or dog. The ammonium salt of cyanic acid is urea. So this, back in 1828, overturned um, a theory called the vital force um, theory, which, which held that all living things contained a vital force that couldn't be replicated by people. And that includes things which are derived from, from life as well, things like urea. So the hypothesis was that we could never make these molecules of life because they contain some mystical force. And this work and others, and others like it back in, back in 1828 really overturned this idea and started off chemistry as a subject where we could actually go and make the molecules of life and understand what they do. So this really changed the direction of, of science. So the reaction that he's talking about is a really simple one. It takes two inorganic molecules and turns them into this organic one here. So this is urea, this is ammonium and isocyanate, and this produces urea here. So a very, a very, very trivial chemical reaction, but one that really overturned um, preconceived ideas. I should credit here, this, this man here is George Painter, my, my grandfather, shown here with, with his wife, Joan, back in 1995. Um, and he, he was a, a very erudite man. There, are, there aren't many scientists in my family, actually. He was, he was actually one of the foremost uh, biographers of Proust during the 20th century. And one of the other strange things that you find out when you're, doing the, when you're preparing for this kind of lecture is that this, this band here, this seminal folk rock group called Fairport Convention, actually covered one of his poems in the, in the, back in the 60s. I never knew that. He never mentioned it, that's for sure. And as you can tell probably from the dress, you know, from the, bo the bobble hat, he wasn't really the most rock and roll sort of person. But still, it was, it was, it was nice to find out. But back to this idea of total synthesis. So Ma Martin Bryce, this gentleman shown here, who people in the audience might know better as somebody who's worked on kind of electronic materials, was actually teaching me about total synthesis in, in my undergraduate course. So he was my first introduction to things like vectrosynthesis, which is this very elegant process by which we aim to make very complicated molecules from much simpler ones by thinking about how we would, how we would go back to those starting materials. So what are the steps we would need to make to go all the way, all the way back to something much simpler? That might be these kinds of cheap and simple starting points like this, which can then be put together to make much more complicated molecules like this one, Taxol, for example. The first total synthesis of which actually happened in 1994, around the time when I was kind of entering, entering the last couple of years of my degree. And this had obviously made a huge impact on the field. And, and, and Martin was telling us about how, how those chemists went about making this phenomenally complex molecule. And that really grabbed my imagination, the idea that chemists could construct molecules of such fearsome complexity. And also David O'Hagan, who was teaching me about biosynthesis. So I chose to go down a total synthesis route, but, but I always remember David's lectures on, on the process by which nature makes these very complicated molecules here. And those two things, those two things taken together encouraged me to go down a, a, the route of chemistry and think about total synthesis as something that I would do my, uh, my PhD on. So it's probably in... Um, about 1994, probably about the same time as those tax law papers were being published, actually. And I was sort of lying in my, in my room out in some godforsaken part of Durham, I think. I mean, we couldn't afford any heating and I was freezing to death. And I was probably a bit hungover and I was probably trying to avoid to go to a stats thermo lecture because no matter how good your degree course is, stats thermo always is the one that people tend not to like the most. So I was sitting there, I was biding my time. And Andy Bell, this guy up here, called me, so I was in my dressing gown. He called me, I answered the phone, and he, and he told me that if I could defend my case, he'd give me an internship at Pfizer the next summer. So I had to gather my thoughts, think quick. And I managed to convince him somehow, I'm not quite, I can't remember what I said, but I managed to convince him to take me on, to go, to go the following summer, that's the summer of 95, to go and work in, um, in Pfizer as one of their kind of student interns for, for 10 weeks. And it's had, a, it's had quite an impact on me. 
we, I went to, to work here in Sandwich. If this is when, at the time when um, Big Pharma were, growing, were building these enormous glass palaces. So there was a feeling that the pharmaceutical industry was going to be able to solve all, all of our therapeutic problems, cure every disease simply by doing it bigger and with more glass buildings. And, and, and to an extent, they're still doing that, but they're doing it in Boston, not in Sandwich. So, yeah. Um, still, it was very striking as an undergraduate coming to this kind of environment with huge confidence that we'd be able to solve all of these problems. That turned out not to be entirely true, but still, there were some amazing things that were done in this site. Um, Andy, in particular, was responsible for the discovery of this little blue pill, which I won't go into the details of the therapeutic application, but he was a co-inventor of, of this drug, Sildenafil, or Viagra, and at the, same, in the, at the same site and around the same time, Maraviroc, one of the mainstay drugs for HIV, and fluconazole, an absolutely essential antifungal, were all discovered on the sandwich site. And of course, that site is now closed, which is a, which is a great shame. But that, I mean, that, that kind of feeling that we could create small molecules, these are, not, these are not massively complex molecules, but we could design them, we could create them through chemical ingenuity and solve big, big problems, big diseases. So I was working in the group, I wasn't working in Andy's group, I was working in the group of this guy, Alan, Alan Stobie, who was a fantastic educator. He educated many medicinal chemists so, over the years. Um, yeah, really, really, really fantastic medicinal chemist. Although I must say, he had a strange, strange uh, attitude towards his interns. So he called all his interns Toby, which is a little bit disconcerting. And, uh, and you know, if you've been out on the town in Ramsgate and you come into the lab in the morning, the first thing you'd be confronted with is Alan drying his wet trainers in the vacuum oven, which was not, not pleasant. But I still, learned, I still learned quite a bit from that, from that project. I was, I was actually working on a backup candidate for the candidate that was already moving through clinical trials, and unfortunately, during that process, the, can the original candidate fell down due to dog liver toxicity, which made everybody very sad. I couldn't really understand why a dog would be that important in the process at that time, but you know, somewhere, somewhere down the line, I really appreciate how that made everybody very sad. I had time to learn Ultimate Frisbee. I played a lot of Ultimate Frisbee <laughs> at Pfizer. They had some fantastic playing fields there. And ultimately, I finished my degree, received, uh, got given my, uh, given my degree by Sir Peter Ustinov, who was the Chancellor of Durham University at that time. And I was all set to go off and you know, do research on, on, on total synthesis. And in the meantime, I'd been calling Steve Lay about every week, I think. His secretary must have been uh, sick and tired of hearing from me. But I wanted to impress upon him my great enthusiasm for working in his group. And I'm very grateful that he eventually took me on. So I went up to Cambridge and, and worked in, in Steve's group. And Steve, I mean, Steve's group at, at the time I joined it, um, it still is, but it was at the time extremely special. I mean, it had, everybody was just extremely focused on developing methodology and chemistry and also applying it to total synthesis. And everybody in that group was, was completely focused on this objective. And this is just a selection of a few of the, of the very fearsome molecules whose lab has synthesized over the years. Um, I'll say a bit more about one of, those, one of those in a minute, but it was just an amazing environment in which to soak in all sorts of knowledge about organic chemistry. There were you know, 20 postdocs, 20 PhD students, all just talking about organic chemistry all day, every day, which might not sound like everybody's cup of tea, but for me at that point in time, it was definitely what I, what I wanted. So I was at Downing College, um, and in between doing a lot of music and also some skiing, because Steve used to take us on skiing trips every year, the whole group. Um, off to Les Arc and, and so forth. So it was, it was a really a fantastic uh, social experience. I also had time to do some work in the lab. I will mention that the, the, I was working alongside many other PhD students, several of whom were working on this molecule here called the Zediractin. And this molecule alone took 46 people 22 years to synthesize. Okay, just to give you a feel for how difficult some of these molecules are to make. It might take you five minutes to draw it, probably take you another, probably half an hour to make sure you didn't make any mistakes but to actually synthesize this 22 years. And when you're working alongside the kind of sixth or seventh PhD student in a row who has not managed to make this molecule, you get a real feel for the endeavor, the endeavor that that takes. And, and I've got to say, the people working on that project are fantastic, were trained fantastically in organic chemistry and include many professors around the country. Um, the, head of, the worldwide head of, uh, of Pfizer's uh, MedChem, for example, Tony Wood, was trained on this project. So just, it's a fantastic training ground for organic chemistry. Um, and you can choose your molecule as difficult or as easy as you like, and you can try and make it, as long as there's some kind of challenge. So I was working with this guy, Darren Dixon, who was on his first postdoc. He just joined, just joined Steve's lab from, from Steve Davis's lab in, in Oxford, where he did his PhD. And some of you, I'm sure, will know Darren well. Um, but he, he took me under his wing, and we worked on, that, worked on the project together. 
and also this guy, guy Reiner Haag, who if you work in materials chemistry, you might know quite well. So Reiner um, was a very, very straight-laced German guy. I'm not the cleanest in the fume hood, I've got to say. And he was very tolerant. But yeah, he had to bite his tongue from time to time. So, so right, yeah, Reiner's now a professor over in Berlin. But he taught me to do columns. So he taught me, you know, he taught me silica column chromatography in the German way. So this is what I was working on, the total synthesis of this molecule. This is a lot simpler than resiliractin. And I was able to complete it in about a year. But I had to develop some methodology to do it. So using these very simple starting points, and making molecules of this type, which have, for the chemists amongst you, an oxygen attached to what is nominally an anomeric center. Although, you know, if you're a sugar chemist, this isn't much of a sugar, but anyway, there's an anomeric center in here. And you can see that this is tethered to the chemist once again, a nucleophile to that center. <coughs> and under the right conditions, you can actually rearrange in the same molecule this nucleophile to the anomeric center and form a new um, carbon glycosidic bond here. So these are oxygen to carbon rearrangements, and it allows you to set up new connectivities and new, and new stereochemistry. So I had a lot of fun developing that chemistry over, over the course of about three years and doing a few total syntheses on the side. Published quite a few papers. Um, I should mention I, de I dedicated ultimately my thesis to this guy, Richard Cannell, who unfortunately passed away during my, during my PhD. But he was working at GSK on the isolation of natural products. So he, he'd fly a hot air balloon across the canopies of various jungles and just pick up the various things that he found along the way and start extracting the natural products from them. So yeah, a fantastic natural product chemist. And you know, one of the few scientists in my family. Yeah, one of the other features of the Steve Lay experience is at the end of your PhD, when you finish your viva, you're given this, uh, this tankard, which has a glass bottom, and they fill it with, uh, with champagne at about minus 78. And they expect you to drink it in front of the, you know, the 40, 40 assembled group members. And they time you, and they put your time on the wall. So it's a little like Top Gear, I guess. But it was slightly, slightly, uh, well, it wasn't traumatizing. It was, it was, quite, it was fine. And it's still on my desk, and now it's serving a different sort of purpose, of course. But on, on that is emblazoned a, uh, you know, a motto, and that's what I got. So Ed Tate, never late, ode to see you soon, love the Whiffin, which kind of reflects the level of you know, sophistication in their punning. The Whiffin is the lab we were working in, and Ed Tate, never late, definitely resonates with my students. So I don't think I, <laughs> I'm rarely on time for a meeting, but that's because I'm too busy these days, not because I'm in bed. <laughs> I hasten to add. So this being Cambridge, you know, some guy has to grab your fingers and a bit of Latin gets said, and then you get to leave. <laughs> so that's, that, was, uh, that was my graduation from Cambridge. And then, as, as Alan has already mentioned, I had the fantastic experience of getting an 1851 fellowship. So I don't know how many of you are aware of the 1851, the Royal Commission of 1851. Um, it was set up around an exhibition that happened in Hyde Park in 1851. Um, and Prince Albert was intimately involved with this. And at the end of this, they've made an enormous amount of money from this, from this international exhibition where many people came from around the world. And they built the original, the original Crystal Palace on it. But Prince Albert wants to use this funding to actually do something useful, so this, this profit from this uh, exhibition. He wants to use it to increase the means of industrial education and extend the influence of science and art upon productive industry. And this was not a fantastically popular general idea at the time. And Prince Albert was really, was really leading leading thinking along these lines. And they bought the entire site. This entire site is, is, uh, was purchased by the Royal Commission of 1851. And they are now, the, you know, Imperial College are pretty much the tenants of this organization currently. And you can see where we are. We're just here. Hyde Park's up here, Royal Albert Hall here. So this entire site was, was de um, developed by virtue of this particular exhibition. But they also give out fellowships. So one of the other things they use their, their profit for was to develop a fellowship fund and I was lucky enough to get one of these, which gave me two years of funding of my own to go where I wanted to go in the world and do, and do what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was go to Paris. So, and you know why that is. Right? So, so it's a very, very beautiful city. So I was living on the opposite side of the Jean d'Angie Luxembourg, and I'd walk across this thing every day to get to work. And I'd be able to spend a lot of time in cafes in my favorite, in my favorite squares like saint sulpice A very beautiful city, a fantastic place to spend a couple of years. I highly recommend it, especially for a postdoc. Um, but, I mean, the, 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 the choice of who to work with was also an important one. It wasn't just to go to Paris. So, <laughs> so as Alan mentioned, I was working for, for this guy, Sam Zard. And the common connection really here is, is this man up, up in the corner. He's really one of the giants of 20th century chemistry, Sir Derek Barton. So Sir Derek actually did his undergraduate degree and, and PhD at both at Imperial College. He completed them both in the course of just four years, apparently arriving in 39 and leaving in 42. And his reason for coming to Imperial is 
absolutely as true today as it was you know, 75 years ago. He said, the fees are the highest here, so it must be the best. <laughs> absolutely true. So he was the director of the, uh, of the ICSN for, for a period at Chief Stewart which is where I ultimately went for, for my postdoc. And he won the Nobel Prize, by the way, in, in chemistry in, 19, in, in 1969. But he also mentored some of the, some of the great chemists um, uh, who are, you know, who, who are of the 20th century as well. I mean, Steve Lay, for example, Jack Baldwin, our own Tony Barrett, and, and Sam as well. I don't know how well you can see the expression on Sam's face. If you know, if you know Sam, this is the expression he gets when he can't believe you, you said something that stupid. <laughs> so I guess he's sitting in a lecture. He's not here today, I'm happy to say. Um, but yeah, I used to get this face quite a lot, actually. And when I arrived at the ICSN, which was actually a, an institute devoted to natural product chemistry, which was a fantastic place to be, um, I was actually, actually greeted by this very genial Frenchman here, Professor Pierre Potier, who was um, at the time just, just moved on from being the, the head of this, of this institute following, following Derek Barton. Um, and he, I didn't realize this at the time, but he was actually responsible for taking um, the synthesis of Taxol and making it useful. So he actually made that molecule that I mentioned before, this billion dollar selling anti-cancer drug. Trying to isolate that drug from its natural source was never gonna be enough to cure anybody. What this guy discovered is that you can actually extract a precursor, this molecule here, from the needles of the pines that grew around the ICSN. So this is the ICSN down here. It's set in a beautiful set of forests down here. And he realized that you could extract this molecule from the needles, which is a renewable source, and actually turn that later into taxol. So he actually is, has, a, has a, a marked responsibility for the success of cancer chemotherapy. And he also figured out what the target was in the, in the cell. So we started off in this place, but then we moved to this very strange um, institute called the Ecole Polytechnique, which is actually a military college. It was set up to train um, soldiers in the, in, the, in the engineering and mathematics of artillery, hence the crossed artillery um, cannon symbol down here. And I can't imagine anyone less military than Sam. So his students were all, you know, all, you know, lieutenant this and captain that. It was a very strange place. And I, I continued doing synthesis and I continued doing methodology. And, you know, by the end of this, I'd maybe made, or contributed towards the synthesis of maybe six natural products, and I published about 12 papers, something like this. Um, and it was, a, it was a very great experience overall, but I realized that I've probably not got what it takes to spend 22 years employing 46 people to make a molecule as formidable as, as a Zadaractin. Um, and I thought, you know, maybe I can use all this information, all this knowledge that I have to do something a little bit different from what my, my, my mentors have been doing. So it's, it's highly valuable work, but maybe I could do something with it. So this gave me a, a bit of a decision point. So I really had to make a decision about what I was going to use my organic chemistry for. Um, and I actually sat down and thought, what, where is organic chemistry going next? What's the biggest area that it could contribute to in the future? And I, I, I thought probably this was going to be either biology, so chemical biology, or um, plastic electronics, so molecular electronics. I actually sat down and thought, you know, which of these two areas should, should I go into? And I started making applications to different labs, and I could have ended up in either area, I think. Around this time, I was very fortunate to get married to Rafa in, in Paris at a, a beautiful wedding. So that side of my life was totally sorted, but I started to figure out where, you know, where was the career headed. Um, this was a, yeah, a tricky decision, because I'd never worked in biology. I'd never held a pipette, never seen an E. coli or anything else. Um, and I, I'd certainly never made a plastic electronic. So I wasn't, you know, wasn't perhaps coming with the best set of skills. However, I was very fortunate in the Institut Pasteur has a very obscure fellowship that it can only award to the U to UK or US citizens. And it turns out there aren't that many people who want to go to Paris and, and do biology in French, or at least at that time there wasn't. So I, I was very lucky to get that fellowship and be able to go to the Institut Pasteur, um, which is one of the, fun one of the, one of the most uh, prestigious um, biomedical institutes in France. And I was working in the lab of people who worked with this guy, Jacques Monod. So I was working in, in the groups of people who had been mentored by this guy. And he won the Nobel Prize back in 1965 for a dis discovery of, of, of transcriptional regulation, so the mechanism by which that happens, and later on also enzyme allosterase. And he said that anything that's found to be true of E. coli, so the bacterium, must also be true of elephants. Okay, because the DNA in E. coli and the DNA in elephants is coming from the same molecular basis. The chemistry is the same. And to a first approximation, he is right, um, despite the fact that elephants are a billion, billion times bigger than an E. coli. There is, there's common ground there. And I must say, my lab at Pasteur, 
possibly hadn't moved on enormously far and was really living or dying by the, on, on, on this maxim here. We only worked on E. coli. <laughs> we, we mostly worked on transcriptional regulation, but there was a lot to be found there too. And this is a picture of me in the lab holding some E. coli. It looks like I'm about to juggle it or I don't know, do a magic trick or something. But I, you know, I'd only just learned how to pour an agar plate. So I was probably just proud that I managed to do it properly. Um, I'd like to draw your attention for my students to this gel down in the left corner. This is a 32 lane DNA Sanger sequencing gel. And I ran several of these every single day that I was there. And you can imagine the difficulty of pouring a, you know, a 32 well gel that's kind of this big and then trying to peel it apart without breaking it. Yeah, it was a real knack to it. So I learned a lot about gels, a lot about gels in that process and sequencing DNA through a very traditional process. It was quite, it was quite an education for a chemist. And of course, it wouldn't be France without some strike action. So, you know, in, the, in 2003, there was an enormous set of strikes all across France. And I've never been picketed in my own lab by my own group members. That's no, I hope it never happens here. <laughs> really, I, I mean, they were, they were kind of parading down the middle of the Institut Pasteur. It was, it was great stuff. A lot of solidarity there. But anyway, I was able to learn enough about biology to, to start thinking about how I, would, how I would use this in the future. So then that led me to Imperial. So this is where, you know, this is where this, this part of the story, or the, the final part of this story begins. And I, I came to work for this guy down here, Robin Leatherbauer, who's been at Imperial since 1984, I have been at Imperial since 1984. And this is a picture of him in the protein engineering group of, of Alan Furst. There's quite a, few, quite a few famous people in here, some of which we also work with. And, and since then he's moved on to Liverpool John Moores University. But I've been told by, a, I guess, a reliable colleague while I was working at, um, at GIF in the, in the ICSN in, in France, that Robin was, was most reliably found in the coffee room. So I told my mum this and she said, well, that doesn't sound very impressive. But I thought, you know, this sounds like the kind of PI I'd like to work with. Um, and it's true, he does, spend, <laughs> he does spend quite a lot of time in the coffee room, but <laughs> there's a lot to be said for that, I think. And he is a fantastic mentor. I actually arrived to work with these guys, so Rudiger, um, Piers, and, and Alethea on a joint project between these labs. And this introduced me to the challenges of doing collaborative work between multiple groups and trying to make that work properly. This, this particular project, I can't say, was a fantastic success, but it still, it taught me, I, I learned a lot from the process. Perhaps more successful was our joint um, supervision of this guy down here, Tuuk, who was a student from Thailand. He's a bit camera shy. This is actually the only photo I have of him. And he also managed to, almost managed to escape from that one. But he, we were working together on peptide synthesis. So I thought I managed to escape completely from total synthesis, but it turns out I had one left in me. And we did this. We, we synthesized this type of natural product, which is based now on a peptide sequence. So it's a little bit like a protein. It actually comes from DNA in this particular case. But it's, quite, it's, it's a lot smaller, and it has an incredibly compact structure, as you can kind of see from this, from this uh, video here. So we actually synthesized this thing and put it all together. Um, quite fascinating. And also, it turns out to be a very potent inhibitor of certain enzymes that are important in disease. And we developed some cool ways of making it by driving the enzymes that it inhibits back the opposite direction. So rather than cleaving the bonds, we were able to force them to synthesize the bonds and produce, uh, produce these natural products kind of uh, semi-synthetically as well. So I got my first introduction to, to peptide and protein chemistry in Robin's lab. And yeah, he's been a great mentor ever since. And I think, I mean, the, the thing that struck me for, through all of this, all of these kinds of different experiences is, is that genetics is very powerful. Okay, it's a very powerful part of biology and you can answer a lot of questions with genetics. What is the bit of, about biology that you can't address so directly with genetics? And it turns out that that's the chemistry that cells do. So the stuff that happens after DNA is sort of left off. What happens to the proteins after that and the chemistry that happens later on? And you can't, you can't address that directly every time using a genetics experiment. It, you can use it as part of the experiment, but you need something more. And this talked to me something about the, comple the evolution of complexity. So starting with E. coli back down here, this has 4,000 genes, this organism. So 4,000 DNAs, DNA sequences that code for proteins. It can step up to something like yeast, which actually is a much more complex organism, but only has 5,000 genes. To something like C. elegans, which is a, a round one, this, this, uh, this organism here, a multicellular organism, 20,000 genes in its, in its genome. And actually, after that, you don't need more than 20,000 genes to make an arbitrarily complicated multicellular organism. Some organisms do use more than that, but you don't need them. So 15,000 genes in a fruit fly, 20,000 genes in a mammal, so in a mouse, and in an elephant, and also in humans, regardless of their athletic ability. <laughs> so a whole, a whole lot of diversity you can achieve through, through these 20,000 genes. That's definitely true, various levels of competence. But still, a, fan, a, fan, a fantastic variety of things from a really small number of genes. And there are reasons why this is, that you can make complex organisms or very simple ones out of a similar number of genes. 
part of that is we start down here with the human genome at 20,000 genes. The process of turning that into the messenger that I mentioned before produces a certain amount of extra diversity, so kind of 100,000 um, different messengers from, from 20,000 genes. And then that gets turned into protein, probably with pretty high fidelity. But then chemistry takes over and introduces a level of complexity that's absolutely astronomical to the, to the proteins in the cell. At a conservative estimate, the number, because we have up to 600 or 1,000 possibly different chemical modifications that can be made to proteins, and they can carry many at the same time, the human proteome, that's the complete complement of proteins in one of your cells, is probably of the order of 10 million chemically distinct species in any one cell in your body. So 10 million different proteins from just 20,000 DNAs, probably only about half of which are actually expressed in any given cell. So really, chemistry pr produces a complexity that biologists often don't want to know about. You know, they don't like hearing that their protein is modified in this way if they can't study that modification as well. There often aren't tools available to, to effectively study these things. And it's only in the last five or 10 years that people have really started to address this problem of chemical complexity, mostly using the tools of, of mass spectrometry. So here's an example of a, of a, of a modified protein, and we've been focused mainly on a, on a modification known as lipidation. So this little black part down here is actually a lipid, so a piece of grease effectively that an enzyme is added onto a protein to change its chemistry. Okay. And uh, similar to what we saw before, you know that oil and water don't mix, so if you add something greasy onto a protein that's otherwise quite hydrophilic, that hydrophobic part will want to bury itself from all of the water that, it, that surrounds it. So this is a protein called, it's called ARF1, ADP ribosylation factor 1. And that lipid, when the protein is synthesized, will get buried right down in the structure of the protein, and it will be buried inside a, hydro, a hydrophobic cavity somewhere where that lipid wants to sit. So you can see that there. Okay, so it will bury, bury the lipid away from the water. But under certain circumstances, that protein can be induced to flip that lipid out to make it to, to, to release its function. So when that lipid flips out, it has to get away from this water. And the place it tends to go to is the membrane. So the membrane is the greasy part of the cell. It surrounds all of your cells, and there are many other um, subcellular organelles inside your cells that are surrounded by membranes as well. So this lipid will head to, the, head to a membrane where it'll stick to some extent, okay? and that can change its function. So the chemistry, which is certainly beyond the direct control of genetics, has changed how this protein behaves. It's changed where it goes in the cell. And actually, the enzyme that does this, so the enzyme that adds that lipid onto the, onto the protein, is actually an enzyme called enmeristyl transferase in this particular case, or NMT, which is an enzyme we've been working on for quite a while now. And it actually takes the, uh, the protein as it's emerging from the ribosome, that complex, that complex machine that produces proteins from mRNA. As this peptide, this protein as it's being synthesized, pops out of the end of the ribosome, It'll be captured. The methionine, you might recall, is the first amino acid that's present on every protein because it's the, the start signal to start the translation off. Methionine amino peptidase can remove that methionine, and then NMT can come along and slap that lipid on the end to change the function of that protein. And it'll do so only when it finds uh, the amino acid glycine at the end, and only then on a certain selected set of proteins. And the way this enzyme works is shown here. So the enzyme is, is in blue. The substrate is in green. That's coming out of the ribosome, if you, if you can imagine. And then down here in this pocket is this molecule here called meristyl-CoA, which is the bit that carries the lipid and is going to be stuck on. So NMT, the, the enzyme that does this reaction, buries the lipid once again in a hydrophobic cavity to take it away from the water. And its role is to bring this part of the protein that's coming out of the ribosome and this part, which is going to deliver the lipid, into close proximity to its catalytic center. So this is actually the C-terminal acid of the protein, which then deprotonates the N-terminal amine of this substrate up here, and then transfers the lipid to it using this, using this chemistry shown here. So then that delivers that meristate group onto the end of the protein. That protein is then free to fold and to, form, and to, and to undertake its function in the cell. And the difference here between a protein that carries a lipid and one that doesn't is that it goes to the membrane. And at the membrane, it can see a different set of things. So whilst it, uh, in the cell, whilst it's floating around in the cell, it may, it may see one set of proteins. If it goes to the membrane, it sees a completely different spectrum of proteins. And this can kick off completely different biological processes. So the presence of that lipid has a fundamental out impact on how that protein works. And in my lab, we're also interested in what happens if we create a drug that blocks this enzyme. What's going to be the consequence for this protein? So it's going to lose its lipid. It will lose its ability to go to the membrane. And then it may also lose its function. And it may, that may have an impact. And we were interested in understanding what substrates are modified and also the therapeutic applications of compounds that are hitting this enzyme up here in the pathway. So it turns out that there's a lot of different lipid modifications out there. And we've actually studied all of these and developed probes for all of them. Um, Mercillation is shown here. That's the one I've just been talking about. 
but there's a whole, a, whole, a whole zoo of different modifications out there. But what's common to them all is that there are really no methods for us to allow us to study these modifications in a living system. So if we want to understand what's modified, how it's modified, how it changes over time, how it changes to conditions, how it changes in response to a drug, we can't do any of that at the, at the level of a whole cell or a whole organism. You could go after one protein at a time, but there are literally thousands of proteins that are modified with lipids. So if you do something to the system, you need to understand how it, how it changes as a whole. So there really weren't any methods to do this, and this is what attracted us to the field at the outset. So finding a way to actually study these modifications as they're added to proteins and as those proteins go about their business in the cell was, was the kind of objective that we were setting ourselves. And we, this was really a challenge, and it's a challenge for the following reason. So you can get the lipid into the cell okay, or it can be produced in the cell, and it can get attached to the proteins inside the cell. But once you get that, once that, pro, once that lipid's been attached to the protein, it really doesn't have much chemistry to it. It's, it's, a, it's a greasy yeah. modification that has an important function inside the cell, but really doesn't provide you with much of a way of handling it, let's say. So what do we do with that lipid once, it, once it's been attached? We can't find a, a way to easily study it. So working with uh, these guys, so we kind of form I formulated this idea with Paul, Paul Boyer, who was a PhD student in the lab, and Will Heal, who subsequently took it on and, and helped, helped us make it work. The idea here is quite simple, that we could stick a, a spy onto the end of our, our lipid. Okay? So we could stick something on there that's masquerading as the lipid that the, the cell just doesn't know is there because it's such a fantastic spy. And it, this spy will then spy on what that lipid is doing inside the cell. So it'll be attached to the substrates when it's in the cell. And when, when it comes out again, we can maybe give that spy some cool gadgets, right? Some gadgets that will allow, allow us to do something with it. So we could give it something to allow us to know that it's there, so to signal to us that it's actually been added, and something that allows us to pull it out, to extract it from that complicated mixture of the cell. And then, hopefully, it can report back to us on the top secret things that these lipids have been doing whilst they've been going around in the cell. So this then allows us to get a window on what the cell's been doing with the, with the lipid that we're studying. And this presented it with a bit of a challenge. So what can be small enough that the cell doesn't notice that it's there, but can also be addressed by some kind of chemistry to attach these gadgets, right? So we need a method of allowing our spy to come into contact with, it, with the gadgets that we want to add and to give this, give this spy the ability to report back to us. So we need chemistry to be able to do this. And the problem with organic chemistry that I've been taught and had used in the lab is that it doesn't work well in biological systems. They're just too complicated. There's too much water around. It's very difficult to make many, much organic chemistry work under those conditions. We need to heat it up, we need to cool it down. It doesn't tolerate complicated chemistry. There are side reactions, toxic catalysts, toxic byproducts. Trying to do normal chemistry in the cell is very challenging. So there's only a certain select set of, of, of reactions that we can use here. And in this context, these, these chemicals here are really privileged motifs, as we would call them in chemistry. So these guys, which are alkynes, and these guys, which are azides. So I won't go into the details down here, but these really can masquerade as part of a lipid, and the cell can't tell that they're there, and then you can do some useful chemistry with them. And this uh, whole field, in a sense, click chemistry, reactions that work, was kicked off by this guy, Barry, Barry Sharpless, um, who won the Nobel Prize back in 2001, not for click chemistry, but for um, asymmetric epoxidation, which is a different, completely different thing. But, um, but I don't know, here he seems to be saying this is how much bigger click chemistry is going to be than asymmetric epoxidation. I have a feeling, because it is absolutely huge. And I was really pleased. I mean, we published our first paper in this area back in, uh, back in 2009, I think it was. And Barry was e emailed uh, Eschen Moser, I think it was, and had me in CC on the email. And he said that this seems to be the first sexy use of an amorphing allylic sneaking around until needed in a complex biological system, which is exactly what we were exactly what we were aiming for. It's always nice when you're a young academic to hear that Nobel Prize winners are reading your papers and also think that they're great. That was really nice. So what chemistry can we use for this? There's a whole zoo of things out there. People keep inventing new reactions all the time, but actually, they're not on the whole new reactions. They're things that were discovered back in the, in the 20th or maybe even 19th century that are being reused because that chemistry actually worked very well, and they were using water as their solvent as well. So these are reactions that, that were fundamental chemistry at the time that are now hugely useful in the modern world. And I think this is a, a message for everybody. You know, fundamental science can really impact you know, 50, 60, 100 years down the line. It can have a huge impact. So this all looks a bit complicated. I'm going to break it down with an analogy that I think my, my son would appreciate with his love of supercars. If you, there's a supercar there. Um, so my analogy is going to be this one. So these guys down on the left-hand side are the James Mays of, of ligation reactions. They're not particularly fast. And they're extremely fussy about the conditions they're made to work under. Okay, so that's, a, that's, a, that, that's probably a less preferable area to work in. These guys up here are the Clarksons of ligation. So they're, they're very fast. They're a bit too fast. They're not fantastically reliable, and they're actually a bit dirty. <laughs> so we don't like to mention it. Most people don't like to look too carefully, but they turn out to be quite dirty. 
So what are we left with? We're left with the Richard Hammond of biological ligations, okay? <laughs> it's about fast enough, fairly reliable most of the time, certainly compared to the alternatives, but still prone to epic failures under certain conditions, as my students will attest. <laughs> However, that's the, you know, this is the reliable chemistry that we've come to, come to know and love in my group. So how do we do this in practice? For the chemists amongst you, we stick an, stick an alkyne onto the lipid, we feed it into cells, we let it get incorporated into the cell. We can then expose that lipid to all sorts of different conditions, different organisms, different, different conditions of cancer or of, of development. And we can let that, our little spy, which is the alkyne, report back to us eventually on what happened to it whilst it was in the cell. We can then extract it from the cell and do that sort of ligation chemistry that I mentioned. And we can attach these reporters. So these are the gadgets, effectively, something that allows us to see that spy and something that allows us to pull it out of its complicated system to analyze it in more detail. So these are the, li are the ligation reactions that are so powerful. We can create these kinds of conjugates, and we can do all kinds of experiments with them. We can extract the proteins, quantify them, identify them, and do all kinds of things that were not possible before, especially for lipids. And we can do it in any, any kind of complicated system. So now we can start to ask questions about modifications like this that we couldn't before. So I think I should mention, because it's only fair, the funding challenge. So at this stage, I think my son had just been born. My contract was about six months to run out. I didn't have any funding, and I was being rejected from fellowships left, right, and center. So I was, I was really struggling to get funding at this point. Um, and I, I don't know how many people know these kinds of statistics, but actually the UK Im invests one of the lowest levels of its GTP, GDP in research and development in the developed world. So it's way behind these other, these other countries, and um, probably two times lower than Japan, for example. So, I mean, you might say that that's, you know, you don't want to invest too much in research, but I think it's an extremely important field. And it's extremely productive. The UK leads the world in terms of the number of citations of its papers for the number of million dollars invested. So if we could persuade our, you know, our politicians to invest more, then we'd be getting a whole lot more productivity because this is obviously proportional to the amount of money you put in. So the, the, funding, the amount of funding is limited, of course, but also the fragmentation of that field is very, is very challenging. So in this country, at least, we have many different organizations that, that fund research, from the government to the European Union to charities to industry. And even within those, that fragmented space, there's different organizations that fund different things. So you'll find one organization will fund biology, another one funds medicine, another one funds, funds chemistry. And trying to get them to, to realize that what you're doing is both chemistry and biology can be a real challenge sometimes. So just figuring out who to apply to can sometimes take you most of the time. Even then, you can go to one organization and they say, well, I think the biologist should be funding this, and then the biologist can tell you the chemist should be funding it, and you can end up in a difficult situation. So it can be, it can be a real challenge, especially in chemical biology. Things are improving, but we, we've got a way to go. And I was a bit at the end of my tether, and I think Robin mentioned offhand once, uh, at some point that I should apply to this organization here, BBSRC. Um, and I, I thought there's no way BBSRC would fund my work. I'm a chemist, I haven't done a whole lot of biology, but actually it was exactly the right idea. But they were the only people who actually decided to fund me. I tried everywhere else, but really only BBSRC were willing to, to foot the bill, so to speak, and, and actually give me a fellowship. So credit to Robin, I definitely wouldn't be here today talking to you now without him. So BBSRC picked up our research program and allowed us to start working on the kinds of questions that we wanted to study. So in the last little bit of, the, of this lecture, I'm gonna tell you about what we've been doing really in an, in an up-to-date context. So we were working on malaria initially, a very difficult system to work on, actually, with some serious health implications still around the world. So half a million deaths, m many amongst pregnant women and children. Vaccines, unfortunately, despite some fantastic work by GSK, are not being successful enough and will not eradicate this disease. We've got resistance against the frontline drugs, and, and, the, and the prevalence is obviously hitting those countries that are least able to deal with it. The drug pipeline is definitely improving, but I think there's a clear need for new drugs in this area. I think everybody agrees about that. The parasite is, has a very complicated life cycle that I'm not gonna show you as a cartoon. I'll show you with a video instead, because it's, it's a lot easier to understand. So as, as you all know, a mosquito is the vector for this disease. It bites a person. And when, when the mosquito is infected by malaria, it can inject that parasite into your body. And it comes out of the, the mosquito of something called a sporozoic, this, this parasite here. That parasite then heads to your liver where it enters liver cells and sort of gestates. These parasites are fantastically good at getting into all sorts of cell types and moving around incredibly quickly. It replicates very rapidly in liver cells and then bursts open to release these other forms called merozoites, which then flood into the bloodstream and start repeatedly um, infecting red blood cells. So they replicate inside their blood cells, burst out again. And this cycle of infection and, and in re uh, egress and reinvasion causes the cycles of fever that you often see with malaria. So the, the level of parasitemia, or the amount of parasites in the blood, can rise rapidly. 
and this causes the pathology of the disease. Some of those parasites will go on to turn to something called a gametocyte, which is then taken up by, again by another mosquito. Every time a female mosquito, they're the only ones that feed on blood. And then that female mosquito will go and bite another, another human and close the cycle so the vector vector will, com will complete the cycle of the disease. So here we were working with Megan, who was a PhD student in my group at the time, Tony Holder, who's now at the Crick, and Rita Tawari, who was, working at, who was doing the animal work on this project. And we were trying to figure out, using our spine, what is malaria doing with lipids? So how is it using lipids to, to control its biology? So we stuck our spine, and it reported back on, what it, on what's going on. And we found that the lipidation, in this case by NMT, is, is involved in a huge range of different pathways that the parasite uses to do its business. So moving proteins around, its ability to transmit to new hosts, loads of biology, some of which we've... Um, subsequently explored with Rita in a bit more detail. But really, if you could find a way of targeting this guy in the middle, this enzyme that does the lipidation with a drug, you could affect a huge range of things that that parasite relies on. So this was where we entered the idea of doing this. But we didn't stop there. We applied it to many different areas as well. So we, we applied it to whole animals and explored lipidation during embryogenesis with Maggie Dolman and Tony McGee. We did the same thing in C. diff. This is an antibiotic-resistant bacteria with Neil Fairweather and Tom Charlton here. Yeah, Neil's a pretty hard taskmaster, huh? Yeah, he's actually a very nice guy. Um, and looking at, looking at how, how those bacteria use that use lipids to uh, mediate infection. And also looking at how we might use lipidation to enhance cancer chemotherapy with uh, Manu Thinor, who was a PhD student, and, and David Mann in, in life sciences. So this, this technology goes wide, and it can be used in a lot of different contexts. But going back to malaria, so I, this talk is about drugs, so new drugs for old diseases, and malaria is most definitely an old disease. We've evolved alongside it over, over millennia. So if we want to develop a drug against, against this disease and we want to target this lipidation process in, uh, with that drug, it, it was definitely not something that a single group can do on its own, and this is becoming increasingly apparent over the years. So we assembled an enormous group, well, to me it seemed an enormous group of, of, of academic labs. So some of, the, some of them are shown here. Um, so groups from Nottingham, for example, from York, uh, and, from, and from Mill Hill, or the Crick as it now is. Also Andy, you can see stalking at the back there. Um, Robin over here. So a big group of different, of different academic labs, all of which had different expertise for the project. Andy Bell, now coming back in at Pfizer, still at Sandwich. Um, it was clear by now that the, Sam the Sandwich site was going to be closed out, so they had a last gasp effort to screen things. And in this case, they screened for the, for the benefit of academia. So that was pretty much the last enzyme screen they did at Sandwich, I think. And we got together a whole bunch of funders, because of something like this, you can, you can tell CRUK you need to develop the tools, you can tell MRC you need to develop an anti-malarial, Wellcome Trust you tell them that you need to develop a an anti leishmaniasis drug, and all of those funders can then come together to help you do this kind of project. So this was uh, in collaboration with the group of Tony Wilkinson and Jim Brannigan here up in York, and they were helping us to understand the structure of this enzyme and how drugs might bind to it. So going about the task of trying to design a drug against a, a target is hard, you could go after this, which is the lipid pocket, but actually that lipid pocket is quite highly conserved across humans and parasites, so not a great place to look probably. This pocket we thought was probably more diverse, so this is where the, the enzyme selects for different substrates, and it selects for different things in malaria parasites in humans, so maybe that's a place we can get some leverage. And we thought if you could find a drug that would bind in this pocket and block that substrate from binding, you could stop that enzyme from ever being able to modify its substrates in the cell. This is a bit like a lock and a key, right? So the, the lock is the enzyme and the key is the drug you're trying to develop. So you might ask how many, how many keys would we need to try? So just one key, right? One key, one lock. It's pretty obvious you, wanna, you just use the right key and you, and you open the lock. But actually we were screening against acute malaria, recurring malaria and leishmaniasis and also against humans as a kind of counter target to avoid hitting humans. And so then you might think you need four keys, right? One for each lock. But yeah, nothing of the sort. If we knew how to design those keys, we wouldn't have a problem with disease, I think. So we actually had to look at a total of 200,000 keys in four different locks to be able to do, make any progress in this project. And this is all thanks to, to the guys at Pfizer and at Mill Hill and at the MRCC up in Mill Hill. And we found eight that finally fit after all of this work. And these structures are shown here. And if you think that 200,000 keys is a lot, GSK have just finished a 2 million key screen at Tres Cantos against the same target following, following on from our work showing that it's a, it's a good target to go after. So you can basically scale this and hope to find more things. But this was, this was actually relatively, this was very successful, really. So these molecules are all out there in the public domain. Pfizer released them for anyone to work on. We were busy, well, Jim was busy crystallizing these molecules in NMT. And you can see uh, in cases where we have two different molecules that are binding in the same kind of place, we've got one binding at the top of the pocket, and we've got another one that's binding 
down in this part of the pocket. So we've got two molecules. The concept here might be that we could join those two molecules together to make something that would fill both pockets. So this idea of linking two molecules together through the power of this crystallographic approach to make really potent molecules. And we ended up with molecules rather quickly that were in the range of about 200 picomolar. So these are molecules that are able to inhibit this enzyme at a 200 picomolar concentration, which for chemists will, you'll realize that it's a very potent molecule. If you're not so clear on it, then this is 100,000 times less than the concentration of caffeine in, in, a, in an espresso coffee. So really very low concentrations of molecule that are required to be effective on this target. So through the power of, the stru of structural biology and the chemistry, we were able to get to molecules that are really very effective at inhibiting this enzyme and also very effective in parasites. The way these molecules seem to work in the malaria parasite, you can kind of see healthy parasites up here at the top. The nuclei are in blue and, the, and something called the IMC, which is a, a part of the parasite, is shown in green. So these form little rings around all the nuclei. You can see in the presence of our drug, the NMC inhibitor, we completely obliterate the presence of this green ring, so this, this organelle called the IMC, and also deeply affect the ability of the cells to divide. So this is clearly having a very profound effect on the cell, on the parasite biology. The reason the IMC, this green thing, is important is because it anchors a type of motor that sits just inside the parasite membrane. So the parasite sticks through receptors onto the red blood cell here and assembles this motor inside. And you can see in the video down here, this is a video of a of a malaria parasite invading a red blood cell. And you can see it's kind of getting on the surface and scooting and deforming the surface of the red blood cell. And it's doing that using this motor here, which is anchored into the IMC. And you can see once the parasite reaches the right orientation, it can drive itself into the red blood cell and then complete its, its infection cycle and start replicating. But you can also get a feel for if you were able to obliterate the IMC from the parasite, that motor wouldn't be able to hold on to anything and it wouldn't be effective. So this is a very effective anti-malarial mode of action, in fact. We're currently wrestling with the problem of delivering that key to the parasite inside a mouse or inside a human. That's a very challenging problem to solve sometimes. And we're also worried that it, since this molecule is so fantastic, maybe the, the, the parasite will change to try to change the shape of the lock effectively so our key doesn't fit anymore. And we're, we're kind of wrestling with these questions with the help of the Medicines for Malaria Venture, which are an, an organization that develops antimalarials across the world. So finally, getting to the last couple of topics of, of my lecture, the, the common cold virus. So the common cold virus is right now stealing your protein lipidation. Okay, I can confidently state that for the vast majority of the audience. So this virus has evolved to use your protein lipidation as a cr crucial part of how it works. This is the, cold, the common cold virus here. Um, so the cold is obviously, we all know about that. It actually causes a lot of the exacerbation in asthma and COPD. So a lot of the hospitalization and, and medical care required for patients in these diseases is caused by initial infection with virus and then subsequent bacterial infections. So if we could block the common cold virus, we could really help these patients down here. This um, virus is a, a set of proteins that encapsulate an RNA genome as it happens. And if we look down that axis shown there with that eye, you're kind of looking onto the top, these proteins at the top, at the top surface of the, of, the, of the virus. That's what it looks like. That's what one of those protein sets looks like from the top. So where is lipidation in this system? So you have to look pretty hard to find it. Um, so this is an enormous virus. It's about... 4 million Dalton, something like this. And that little lipid that we're caring about is right down there at the bottom, kind of hanging off the end. So it's just hang it's hanging off the bottom of the virus and it's kind of in contact with the viral genome. It's incredibly tiny compared to the entire size of the virus and it seems surprising that the virus would have evolved to rely on something so tiny for, for, for its life cycle. This is 20,000 times smaller, this lipid, than the entire virus particle. So it's the same as an elephant and an ant effectively, so how could an ant have any impact on an elephant, you might say? So in collaboration with Roberto Solari and Orly Musnier at Imperial, we, we so, sought to address this question. We used our spy once again, but this time infecting cells with the virus to establish that the virus really does add this lipid on. And you can see this quite visually here. So without the virus, it looks like this. With the virus, it looks like this. And you can see this big fat band in here, which is the viral protein being modified. And you can also see that when we add our drug, we completely obliterate the modification of that virus. So we have a drug that is very effective at stopping this virus from, from exploiting your lipidation to, to, to enable its construction. These molecules are phenomenally potent antivirals against the, against the common cold. Um, yeah, potency that, uh, especially against a host target, that's very impressive. And because we're targeting the host, there's no real danger the virus can evolve around that. We think that it's stopping the virus from assembling its capsids, so we think it's blocking this step here, where the, where the precursor proteins form the capsid. And with the Institute of Animal Health at Peerbright, we've, been, we've managed to show that it's equally effective against poliovirus and also against foot and mouth disease virus. So any virus that exploits this type of lipidation, this, these compounds are incredibly effective antivirals. So we're currently progressing that project and trying to see how far we can push it. And finally, 
the greasy hedgehog. Okay, so the hedgehog is, of course, a protein. Most of this talk has been about proteins. And there are actually three different sorts of hedgehog, and they've all got equally stupid names. So sonic hedgehog is the one in the middle. That's the one that was discovered first. Desert hedgehog and Indian hedgehog. Okay, I guess you've got to have a name, right? And I won't go into why they're called these things. I mean, they're called hedgehog because when you knock out that gene in a, in a fly, you get a sort of hedgehog-looking um, embryo out of it. So these, pro yeah, these proteins do have silly names, but they have a very important purpose, which in general is to allow you to develop properly. So you have, a, a, you have two sides to your body thanks to the hedgehog pathway. You would be just one linear strip if it wasn't for hedgehog being able to force your body to form two different sides to cause your, your fingers to, to, to come apart, that kind of thing. So a very important protein in the development of embryos, but unfortunately also act reactivated in certain cancers. So this shows a tumor kind of embedded in the, in the body, in, in the stroma of the tumor, in fact. This is the blood supply being supplied to the tumor down here. And what this hedgehog uh, protein does is it manipulates the environment of the tumor to enable that tumor to survive in the body. Okay. These little pinky molecules here are actually the hedgehog protein that's being pumped out by those cancer cells. And these, these hedgehog proteins are actually engaging the cells that lie around. These are the stromal cells. And they're engaging a particular receptor on the first of these cells, as we'll see in a moment, called patched. So, this protein is docking onto the surface of this receptor, which sits on the, the non-cancerous cells that surround the tumor and support that tumor to grow. So they engage this, this particular receptor and cause it to internalize into the cell on the vesicle. So this is deforming the, the, the membrane. It comes in from the outside. And then through a, a, a mechanism that we don't fully understand, this protein patch somehow activates this molecule called smoothened. So this, they have funny names because they cause patched and smoothened embryos when they're, when they're knocked out in flies. But this is the important molecule here, smoothened. And this is, a, this is also actually a receptor, which then goes and sits on the surface of the, of the cell which is supporting the tumor and, and undertakes its signaling. And th there it produces signals that, help that, that ultimately help the tumor to survive. So this pathway um, that, that, that's reactivated in cancer and, then trans and, tra and uh, transmitted by this protein called GLEE here was actually targeted by Genentech um, quite a few years ago now and has finally been the first, uh, the first drug here, Vismodigib, that was approved for use in cancer. Um, in the tar that targets the hedgehog pathway. And you can see the effect. This is a, this is a, a pet image, I think, of a, of a patient with a very metastasized tumor, so spread about all around the body. And these metastases just melt away in the presence of this molecule. So targeting smoothened is phenomenally potent as an, as an anti-cancer mode of action in certain cancers. However, after about six months, those metastases come back because mutations in this protein smoothened force that allow the cancer to escape from the activity of that drug. So we were thinking, is there another way that we can approach this? So it's interesting for us because the hedgehog, so this is sonic hedgehog up here, the hedgehog protein is actually lipidated. So it's lipidated twice, uniquely, actually. It's lipidated with a cholesterol molecule at the end here. Normally, cholesterol is not good, but anyway, so this molecule is good. And a lipid at the other end, an na star lipid down here. And we were thinking, so how can we address this? Well, we might need two different types of lipids with different sorts of signals. So you can imagine this is more like having two different spies that are going to report back to you along different pathways completely separately. Um, both equally competent and able, to, uh, and able to report back on what lipidation is happening to sonic hedgehog in cancer cells. And by doing this, we're able to actually start to visualize these lipids as they're attached to the protein in, ca in cancer cells. We can actually show that the lipids are important in intact signaling complexes. We can visualize those proteins in cells, so that looking at the two different modifications. And we can start to quantify how those, those lipids are attached during, during cancer development, for example. And in parallel with the uh, Help of, this is a project that was in collaboration with Tony McGee up here. Paulina, who's our PhD student, Antonio and Tom, both postdocs in the project, and several other people in the group who I don't have uh, space or time to, to mention here. We've been characterizing molecules that can knock out this pathway that adds that lipid, this palmitar group, onto hedgehog. So these molecules, then, this was also in collaboration with the Institute of Cancer Research. These molecules here are really potent at, at blocking the addition of those lipids. And it turns out those lipids are absolutely crucial for sonic hedgehog then to go on and signal. So if we, can block, if we can block this pathway, the sonic hedgehog protein is never active in the first place. The cancer could produce it, but it won't be able to signal to the, to the, to the, um, to the surrounding stroma. So we think this could be a really interesting way of targeting the hedgehog pathway right at the beginning before it has a chance to act. And maybe in combination with things that hit smoothened, we might be able to overcome some of this problem of drug resistance. So that project is, is going very nicely. Okay, so finally, just to conclude. Um, so I've, I've told you something about how we've been targeting lipidation in these different diseases, in malaria, in asthma and COPD ultimately. And finally, um, 
in cancer, in drug-resistant cancer. So there's a theme here of chemistry and biology coming together to tackle drug resistance in these kinds of diseases. So um, being a very active chemistry group, we produce a lot of molecules over the years, a lot of different tools and a lot of different compounds, and we've collaborated with a lot of groups, and now we're sending our molecules out across all the different continents of the world, Tokyo, Malawi, um, Chile most recently, rather surprisingly, and, uh, and many companies that we've collaborated with in the, U in the US and especially in the UK and elsewhere. So our, the chemistry that was uh, funded in our group is now reaching out across the world to influence, or to help, I hope, um, collaborations across the world. I got a bit of a critical error on PowerPoint. Sorry about that. Just one second. Yeah, it would be a shame not to be able to mention these slides. So, looking ahead into the future, where is you know where are we taking this stuff next? So, first of all, the new opportunities that we have. I mean, um, you may be aware that Imperial is now setting up a new campus at White City. Out in, the, out in the west of London. Our chemistry department's gonna be moving out there. Most of our research will go, will, will go to this new building that you can see being built here rather quickly. It was pretty quick, actually. Um, this one going up in the background. I love how they build the lift shafts first and then the rest of the building around it. It's amazing. Um, so the chemistry building is the one on the left here. Now completed and being fitted out, we'll be moving in in 2018. It'll be a fantastic new environment. It's right next to a Hammersmith Hospital, right in the middle of a very active um, and exciting development complex. As Alan mentioned, I've now got a group in the Crick. We've got space to do chemistry there, remarkably. I think the Crick still don't fully understand why they have an enormous chemistry lab in their building, but um, I guess it's because I'm there or something, I don't know. Uh, I definitely didn't tell them to put it there. Um, and we've got a cell biology space there too, so some fantastic collaborations to look forward to. We look forward to collaborating with industry, both at White City and in, and in the Crick building, and um, our many collaborations that we've already set up at the Crick. And perhaps most importantly, the next generation. So I've told you a little bit about how I've arrived from, you know, Barton and Steve and Sam and Alan and Robin and, you know, the contributions that these guys have made fundamentally in mentoring me during my career. And I'm hugely grateful to them. Um, but what's been really satisfying is seeing how then I can, you know, mentor other people who might go on to, to do other, other great things, I hope. So Tuk and Megan, who both sit, and Victor, all of whom have set up their own groups in academia quite recently. Um, so that, that's fantastic to see, and I look forward to seeing lots of exciting work out of their labs. And Mark over here, who I, I trust will soon be in charge of uh, GFK in the near future. Um, and, and, and all the people who are coming out of my lab. I mean, there's a huge, a huge number of people um, emerging from my group, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do next. So I'd just like to finally thank a few people. So first of all, my family. I mean, clearly, without their support, I would never have made it. And um, I'm hugely grateful to all of them. I'd like to thank uh, Imperial College uh, for giving me a job. It's not bad, I guess. Ultimately, with a bit of, little bit of arm twisting, giving me a permanent position, and then ultimately, of course, promoting me to a professorship, which I'm, I'm very grateful for. I'd like to thank our funders. We've, you know, millions of pounds have been pumped into our group one way or another over the years. And, you know, I complain a little bit about the chemical biology space, but somehow we've managed to negotiate it reasonably successfully, and we've, you know, we're very grateful to all of our funders. Um, I'd like to mention a few people who I really didn't have time to mention on the slides, but have really been you know, mainstays of my group over many years. Uh, Remy and Goshka and Julia, who have contributed a lot to all of the tools that we've developed. And finally, and very importantly, I just want to thank all of my group members over the years. There's been over 130, I think, members of my group over the past 10 years, of about maybe 30 different nationalities in total. And it's been a fantastic experience working with them. And I look forward to all of the amazing things they're going to do in the future. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you for your very kind attention. Thank you.